What I'm going to talk about is the three novel ways that plans are using to offset their specialty drug costs. And I, if you're tuning in, you probably know this, but I want to just take just a minute and give you my definitions of these just so we're clear. Now, there's a lot of variations in the marketplace. Some of them are hybrids of these, but these are my description of kind of the idealized versions of what these things are. So I think it's a good kind of level setting because I think it'll help motivate what's going to go on. Um, the first one, the one that most people are familiar with, is the copay accumulator. An accumulator means basically we're going to accumulate how much the patient is actually paying out of pocket, and that's the only part that counts toward their deductible. So therefore, a manufacturer's copay support will not accumulate toward the patient's deductible payment, and so the patient will still be responsible for the deductible even, af even if the manufacturer provides copay support to pay for that deductible. So from the plan's perspective, they effectively get the value of two deductibles. And typically these programs are operated by the PBM as an optional benefit that can be turned on or off uh, within the benefit plan. So really nothing has to be done, it's just sort of a benefit design decision. Do you want three tiers or four tiers or five tiers? Do you want an accumulator or no accumulator? So it's a plan sponsor decision when they make that, what they're gonna do. Um, I first wrote about accumulators in January of 2018. And the reason I know it was January 2018, because it was just after the movie The Last Jedi came out, and the entire post deals with The Last Jedi and what this means. So just as a reminder of how we get, how we get here in drug channels. Um, the second, or copay maximizers, essentially the concept here is, well, let's, you know, there might be more money in that copay support program beyond what the deductible is funding. Let's maximize it. So although the deductible could be $5,000, the copay program might actually be funded up to $24,000. So we're going to get the maximum value of that. Uh, the patient's out of pocket will essentially be set to the maximum value of that copay program, and we'll be able to take that money out. The patient will essentially incur minimal out of pocket costs. So it's often seen as better by the patients, um, although there are some challenges. Um, and from the plan's perspective, now I get the full value of that copay program applied to the plan costs minus the vendor fees, which can be kind of hefty. Uh, and one unusual aspect, and I'll talk about this in just a moment, these are typically offered by a third-party vendor, not by the actual PBM itself. And why that is is a good question. And the newest and most controversial one it goes by a few different names, sometimes called specialty carve-out, but that, I think, gets confusing to people. So I'm going to use the term alternative funding programs, alternative funding, which essentially says, you know what? Um, we're just going to eliminate the coverage for specialty drugs or drugs above a certain cost threshold. And therefore, the patients now are uninsured for that drug, and the entire cost of the drug will be paid for by the patient assistance program. The patient incurs, again, minimal out-of-pocket costs, the plan gets the full value of that offset from their plan costs minus the vendor fees, which again are surprisingly hefty, big fees. And typically the vendors that are doing this are not affiliated with the PBMs, uh, they're separate entities, and they essentially get this piece of the specialty coverage carved out, which is why I got that name from a lot of people from that. So those are the three that I want to talk about. And you know my, the way we do things around here. I like to quantify and be very specific about this. We're not just kind of about in general. Let's go in detail what's going on here. And I want to just first show you kind of a stylized example of what happens with each of these different cost offset programs. So kind of a style, it's not a complete map of everything. I've left out some things just to keep the story clean. You can go through it on your, uh, when you see the deck, maybe it'll make more sense, but take a conventional scenario a specialty drug with a wholesale acquisition cost or a list price of about $60,000. Now that's often the way pharmacy reimbursement works. That might be roughly what the pharmacy is being paid for that drug, roughly whack, A to B minus 17 or 18%. Um, and in this first scenario, the patient has an out of po a deductible of $6,000. And however, the manufacturer through its copay support is going to pay that $6,000. So the patient has nothing out of pocket, 
the manufacturer pays a rebate, which I'm just assuming to be 10, 20% for the sake of this example, and also pays that copay. So the payer's net cost is essentially the list price minus what the manufacturer's contributed. I'm excluding all channel fees, I'm excluding a lot of things, but just a simple example. Uh, and so the payer ends up paying a little less than three quarters of the wholesale acquisition cost. However, they could turn on the accumulator. And if they turn on the accumulator, well, the patient still owes that $6,000 deductible, but the manufacturer is also paying that $6,000 deductible. So the met plan gets the benefit of the two deductibles plus the rebate offset that gets passed through to them. And at the end of the day, they're now down to $38,000 of that $60,000 product, or about 63% of the wholesale acquisition cost. So now they've saved money and they're like, wow, that, that's pretty good. But wait, there's more. What if we introduced a maximizer instead of the accumulator? Well, here's what would happen. We're going to assume that the maximizer means the patient is not really gonna pay anything. Uh, and for the sake of argument here, we're gonna say the manufacturer has funded that copay support program up to $24,000 a year. So the patient's copay could be $2,000 a month for the whole year, but they pay nothing, and the $24,000 goes to the plan. So now, the manufacturer essentially is contributing $34,000 of that $60,000. Uh, the vendor is gonna take 25% of that value, of that $24,000, or $6,000. So now, the plan says, well, now I've saved even more money. Now I'm down to almost half of the list price by using a maximizer. So you can see the math of how this drives cost savings or offsets the cost. Um, and then finally, they could say, you know what? Let's just go for it. Alternative funding. No coverage for this drug. You've got to apply to the patient assistance program. Now, there's no patient out-of-pocket cost. There's no rebate. There's no deductible. However, the manufacturer is giving the full whack value of that product to the plan. And the vendor is taking 25% in this example of that whack value. So the plan's net cost is now 25% of the wholesale acquisition cost, and the vendor has collected $15,000. Now, these are illustrative examples. Obviously, it doesn't cover every situation. I've eliminated a lot of fees and other things, but it gives you a sense of what can happen when you start putting in place these cost offset tools and why they're so popular. Um, now, I want you to just keep these numbers in mind for a few minutes, because when I come back to some of the challenges for these programs in the future, we're going to talk about other ways that you could see uh, this whole market unwind.